same kind of relationship with Bush. Um, and it's more important, in fact, this time because there were some reports in the media it, during the election campaign that perhaps the Liberals would have preferred a Democratic president. Of course, Kretschmer didn't get that, and he has hotly denied those claims. However, he wants to try and smooth, uh, smooth the waters and make sure that he does have a good relationship with Bush. So how does he go about doing that? Well, they're going to spend uh, half an hour together, just one-on-one. -on -one. Then they're going to be having a working dinner tonight. No doubt there will be some serious issues that will come up. But also, you know, Kretschmer is a very... Uh, you know, he's a very charismatic guy, as is Bush. They're both people that get along well with people, and they realize that, you know, this is the biggest trading relationship that both countries have, and that it's very important that, uh, you know, as first leaders that they get along. Is he confident at this point that George W. Bush realizes uh, the massive effects of their trading relationship? Oh, absolutely. I mean, everybody in the Bush administration has talked about Canada as the number one. No pomp, no pageantry, with issues like defense and trade topping the agenda. Before today's White House meeting, the Prime Minister will also address the orc. What's happening right now? Are they about to read the bill? The Speaker. The next sitting of this House. There it is. Introduction of private members' bills. So it's just happened, the uh, Speaker reading the uh, bill, which was... Uh, to introduce a bill entitled, An Act to Prevent the Use of the Internet to Distribute Material that Advocates... This is a private members' bill we're listening to now, but the Young Offenders Act, the most controversial piece of legislation before the current session of Parliament, has just been introduced, uh, and there was unanimous consent. There was not an attempt made by the uh, Bloc Québécois, which we thought might uh, do this, and not an attempt to deny unanimous consent to bring in this new legislation. There's a tradition in Parliament, Sandra, that uh, all government bills automatically get first reading. Uh, is there unanimous consent to table the bill and to have it printed? And uh, when the moment came, there was not a single voice raised in objection. So obviously what the Bloc Québécois is going to do is not try and tie it up at this early stage. They want to get the bill on the record so that they will then have something to complain about or to criticize. If they don't allow it to be introduced, then people won't know what's in it because the bill only becomes public once it's been tabled. So it has been tabled. Uh, there was no objection. The minister uh, was not required to stand up normally or often they will give, if it's a controversial bill, a sort of 30-second or one-minute analysis of what it's about. Clearly they didn't want to antagonize the opposition today, so she just uh, sat there, bowed when the speaker called the uh, legislation. He read the title and uh, unanimous consent was given and the bill was printed. and. Uh, will be read at a uh, second reading at a future date. Okay, so when does the, the debate begin? Well, the government, this again is a matter of negotiation among the various party leaders. The government would like to get this through and get it through relatively quickly because the provinces have been asking for some action. But as we've said earlier today, the Bloc Québécois feel that any change to the current law is a negative thing. They think it's only being done for political purposes and they vow to do what they can to make sure that it doesn't come in. So. There will be negotiations uh, among the House leaders, and the question then will be uh, when they can fit it in the calendar and organize committee hearings at which a number of witnesses will be called. That, too, will be a subject of negotiation because, as I say, the Bloc are adamantly opposed to any change. They think that toughening up the Young Offenders Act is picking on kids. They don't believe that it's in the interests of young people who are in conflict with the law to be involved in this way and they're saying, uh, and the provincial government in Quebec, and this is where the Bloc and the Piku government in Quebec City have been working in concert, they're saying this is all being done to try and assuage Ontario and the West who are concerned about youth crime. They say the current law is plenty good, all you have to do is apply it properly as they're doing in the province of Quebec, this is their line, and everything will be fine. So as I said earlier, Sandra, I think one of the things we can expect to see is that there will be a whole series of maneuvers uh, around this bill designed to tie in with Bernard Landry running to become the new Premier of Quebec, the new leader of the uh, Parti Québécois in Quebec City. And I think what you'll see is that the bloc will be somewhat quiescent at the beginning and then up the tempo of complaints about the Young Offenders Act and use this as a stick to beat the federal government. In effect, to say to Quebecers, see, we have to be our own country, to fend off these right-wing fanatics from Alberta and elsewhere for demanding changes and things like perfectly good laws like the Young Offenders Act. And so I suspect what we'll see is this whole thing will come uh, together to a, in a crescendo, probably starting in a couple of weeks and then building up for two weeks until 
the time of Bernard Landry's uh, coronation as leader of the Parti Québécois. Well, let's take a look at a couple of points on this bill. Uh, first of all, uh, actually, uh, tougher anti-stalking laws are included to uh, double the maximum penalty to 10 years from five. Was there pressure on the government to do that? Yes, there are a lot of groups who feel that uh, uh, women in the country, uh, the, the current stalking law they don't feel has been effective in uh, stopping stalking. And this is the kind of stuff that the bloc would not complain about. What they're concerned about is the other stuff related to youth. So yes, there's a, a fairly omnibus, it's almost an omnibus criminal law bill, because as you say, there's stalking involved here, a number of other... Uh, Home invasion, well. stiffer uh, jail terms and fines for people who abuse animals, there's uh, stiffer drunk driving legislation, uh, there is a, a, a more independent, less secretive system to aid Canada's wrongly convicted. Uh, There's money even for the wrongly convicted to read to come out and uh, meet the reporters. And as we do, of course, we've been discussing, Mike, some of the points of this bill. It is a wide-ranging bill, and uh, I think one of the most contentious, thing, contentious things about it is, of course, um, this Youth Criminal Justice Act, trying to do away with the term young offenders because, as you well know, Mike, uh, it's a term that a lot of people have big problems with. Yes, indeed. And Sandra, as we're speaking, Peter McKay of the Conservative Party is coming up to the microphones. It'll be interesting. He is also a lawyer and very interested in this issue. It'll be interesting to see whether uh, he's commenting on this or on uh, some other matter. Well, Mr. Boudria, since he never threatened or intimidated anyone. As I've maintained all along, I'm not going to discuss the private conversation that took place between myself and Mr. Boudria. As to... Uh, uh, Chuck Strahl's comments today in the House of Commons. Uh, I guess that the uh, the Liberal Alliance is fully uh, underway now, and um, that's what they used to call oath helping. So uh, even though Mr. Strahl wasn't there, apparently he uh, has decided he's going to jump on board and, and try to help Mr. Boudry out. So I, I don't know what's at work there, but um, suffice it to say that this uh, this issue is behind us. Uh, it has to do with budgets. I'm not going to be threatened or intimidated, uh, and I've never suggested that Mr. Boudry did that. Mike, can you explain a little bit about uh, what Peter McKay was talking about, a conversation with Don Boudria? Well, last week um, on Monday when they were having an election of the Speaker, the Prime Minister and Joe Clark had a private conversation on the floor of the House of Commons, which shocked Mr. Clark in that the Prime Minister, according to Mr. Clark, basically said to him, I'm not going to forgive or forget the fact that you wrote a letter to the RCMP asking them to investigate me as if I were a common criminal. And Joe Clark said, that's all right, John, I won't let you forget it either. That was Monday. On Tuesday, every Tuesday, the, the House leaders meet to negotiate things like uh, amount of time allocated to various bills. And one of the things they were talking about last week was the amount of money that the uh, opposition parties would get. Um, it looks like Ann McClellan's coming here any second. And in that meeting, uh, it's alleged that Mr. Boudria threatened the Tories or basically said, listen, uh, we'd be a lot more amenable to giving you guys more money for your research staff if you'd lay off these uh, questions to the Prime Minister. So Mr. McKay uh, says, I won't say what went on, but they had tried to intimidate me and I'm not going to uh, uh, roll over for it. And today he seems to be not wanting to stir that pot very much more, except during question period, um, the opposition parties were hoping to keep the pressure on the Liberals on this issue. And Mr. McKay thinks that Chuck Strahl, the Alliance House leader, let the government off the hook uh, on this issue. And so that's why, and again, there's always tension between the Alliance and the Tories because don't forget, they both claim to be the alternative to the government or the alternative on the right, and therefore each is trying to outdo the other. Okay, back to the task at hand. We were talking about Canada's new can we criminal just, I don't know if we can see the uh, foyer of the House of Commons uh, where at the government uh, pool microphone just outside the government lobby, you see the reporters all lined up, and they've all got white uh, folders in their hands, and these are copies of the new... Uh, changes to the uh, criminal law that were proposed today by Justice Minister Ann McClellan and Ms. McClellan's public relations person was there just a minute ago handing these out. So this is kind of a hint that says uh, the lady is coming, <laughs> just uh, stand by, uh, you'll be seeing her shortly. Now we don't know what, uh, the minister is in what is called the government lobby which on the left hand side of your screen is behind those reporters 
It's where the Prime Minister, you see the Prime Minister and Ministers walk in every day. There's an area behind there that is kind of a lounge that has uh, phones and copying machines and coffee machines and, and uh, chairs and televisions to watch the House. And uh, so when her bill was introduced and there was no objection from the opposition, she would get up from her desk, walk out through the curtains into the lobby behind, and then would come out here to uh, face the, uh, the media. Uh, her staff said she'd be coming at 3.15. By my clock, it's now 3.15 and 42 seconds. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we don't know what she's doing back there. Um, very often ministers go there. There are a couple of private phone booths where they can make uh, private calls or if there's some last minute adjustment they're trying to make. But as you can see by the crowd, Sander, there's quite a bit of anticipation about this legislation because as we've pointed out from stalking to um, a whole range of things, it's not just young offenders that we're talking about here. Uh, there are those who are wrongfully convicted and looking for help in uh, getting their cases reopened. Uh, so it covers a whole range of things and there's a lot of public interest. So what's held the minister up now? Uh, Tough questions. There's no question that uh, this bill covers so many issues that uh, that it's, it's going to be controversial on all kinds of fronts. But at the end of the day, the Liberals have a majority. They believe that these measures are long overdue. They uh, will point to the fact that they have fine-tuned, that they have listened to some of the complaints that have been made in the past. And the minister's been fairly candid. Uh, she says uh, she's heard uh, basically all, all arguments on all sides. There's nothing new to be said, and therefore she's bound and determined to go ahead. As we've mentioned earlier, the biggest opposition to any change at all comes from the Bloc Québécois. And um, with their uh, concerted stalling tactics, um, it's almost certain that they will uh, try to make uh, some effort to embarrass the government and to hold it up. Uh, let's look at the minister here. She's coming forward now to the microphone in the foyer of the House of Commons in Ottawa. See you all back. Uh, How will this bill uh, give more flexibility to the provinces, and especially to Quebec, where they're uh, afraid of a domino effect? Well, in fact, uh, first of all, let me say that what we've done today by in reintroducing the Youth Criminal Justice Act is deliver on a Red Book 3 promise from the election and obviously a commitment in the most recent speech from the throne. Um, I have uh, said throughout this entire process that this legislation uh, represents fundamental values of Canadians wherever they live, and in fact, uh, one of our goals has been to provide significant flexibility to the provinces and territories in the administration of the legislation. There is nothing in this legislation that prevents a province, for example, Quebec, from continuing to take the approach that they have taken to young offenders in this country. Can you explain us how? However? Well, in fact, all you have to do... Repeating yeah, this, but, they keep but all you have to... But in fact, they have given us, and I have asked specifically, for specific examples of where, in fact, they would not be able to continue their approach. I have received nothing. And, uh, in fact, all one has to do is look at the legislation and the inherent flexibility to understand that there's nothing in this legislation that prevents a province like Quebec from continuing that which they're doing. Is there that, anything that in this bill that, that, that helps that more than the one you had just before? Well, for example, uh, we have provided greater flexibility uh, through ordering council. If a province chooses, they can uh, choose to uh, uh, promulgate an ordering council uh, ensuring that uh, the age in, uh, under which the presumptive categories of offenses apply is not reduced from 16 to 14. You'll keep in mind that what we are doing in this regime is, is uh, dealing with the presumptive categories of offenses, presumptive in the sense that one would receive an adult sentence, and we are reducing the age within that category from 16 to 14. But we are also making it possible at the request of uh, provinces that, in fact, if they wish uh, to issue a, an order in council through their government that the age stay at 16, they have the ability to do so. And that you? wasn't there in the bill previous to It was election? not in the bill before, but, but keep in mind, what you're seeing today is what you saw this fall. The amendments that are in this legislation are all amendments that we signaled that we would be uh, putting on the floor of the House and in fact did put on the floor of the House uh, before the last election.
So that's one, that one of the amendments? Yes. That's, okay. Ms. Mellon, are you willing to consider substantial amendments again then through committee because the committee no. is the one are saying that there is no. need? Um, in fact, we have been around this subject uh, before committee for quite some time. The amendments that we have made, in fact, there were a significant number of them, some 183 amendments that the government made, we did so in response to what we heard at committee, in response to uh, those who came before the committee who uh, work in the youth justice area, uh, some uh, suggestions from uh, various members of the committee and uh, in fact I think uh, we have consulted broadly we have listened uh, this is our legislative package and I think uh, most Canadians believe it is now time to get on and replace the Young Offenders Act with this new youth criminal what, justice legislation. What are you going to do about the block if they bring in 3,000 more amendments again? That will be up to the government house leader but he and I have talked about this I have expressed my deep concern that one is allowed to hijack parliamentary processes. I have no problem if, if anyone uh, wishes to bring amendments of substance to the floor of the House or to committee. But in fact, as we all know, uh, almost all the amendments proposed by the Bloc were done in uh, the form of stalling tactics, frivolous and vexatious amendments that have nothing to do with the substance of the legislation and have absolutely nothing to do with getting a better youth justice system in this country for young people uh, who obviously are at risk and obviously uh, who have uh, committed various kinds of, of criminal uh, acts. Do you think you have a different system all across the country with some problems with having some There is no different system. We have, no, we have, we have in fact, no, in fact, what we are doing is exactly that which we do within the criminal law generally, which is in fact attorneys general have flexibility now. They issue guidelines now to their prosecutors. Those guidelines vary dramatically uh, across the country. And in fact, our criminal law, we pass the substantive law. How, in fact, it is enforced and implemented rests with the provincial attorneys general and their prosecutors. And in fact, we know now that what is so key to much of our criminal law and its successful enforcement is that local discretion that rests in provincial attorneys general and in local Ms. prosecutors. Ms. McClellan, Ms. McClellan, you have time on, you have time on your side this time? You're saying to the block, we have time on our side this time? You can what, I'm what, saying, want, what I'm saying is that I think we all know the positions and the posturing of, of the sum in this piece. I have absolutely no problem with those who wish to introduce substantive uh, proposals for consideration. But I think, in fact, uh, we have listened, we have consulted. I know that there are those uh, who think that this is not tough enough. I heard the Attorney General of Ontario last <laughs> evening making some very strong arguments about what he would like to see. And, in fact, we uh, have seen some very strong arguments, and I, I think we saw again today in Mr. Cadman's question, we know where the alliance is going to come from. We know where the bloc is going to come from. My responsibility is to work with Canadians to determine what their values are and what they want to see reflected in new youth justice legislation. Well, it doesn't... Been, been, it, it why, does, I just, <laughs> why, why, yes? Tell me, um, you know, a lot of the statistics show that uh, youth crime is actually on the decline. Why, why is there a need to toughen up a lot of these, these measures? Where, you know, where do keep you get it, information? No, to do keep in mind, this isn't about toughening up. Well, we part need, of it is. Well, in fact, it's, it's very, very balanced. And what we want to do is first of all, when you're dealing with non-violent young offenders, what you have to do, in most cases, in my opinion, is try and keep them out of the formal criminal justice system, or at least, if they're in that formal system, have them dealt with by the community, diverted into the community through one mechanism or another. Where you're dealing with violent young offenders, then I think we have to also uh, be responsible in terms of making sure that the consequences do in fact reflect uh, the, the uh, appropriate degree of accountability and responsibility. Um, youth justice, uh, the, the numbers or the, uh, the rate of, of youth crime has gone down slightly over the past number of years. What I think is very troubling is the degree of violence that we now see reflected in some of the ho horrendous acts and I think as a society, we need to ask ourselves why that is happening and what we do 
to deal with it. And that's why so much of this package deals with enhanced rehabilitative and reintegrative measures. What, what, kind, of, what kind of person do you think comes out of prison at the age of, uh, of 35? Uh, at the age of 39, after serving four, uh, 25 years. Well, no, keep, keep in mind, in fact, that uh, first of all, what uh, it's so important to remember that prison or putting someone in detention is the most serious consequence and should only be used in the most serious circumstances. But that. Years. What kind in of fact, do you think comes out of prison at the age of 39? First, look, let me That's let me say years. to you that we have we have prisons, and if someone is if in fact someone is convicted of murder and they are sentenced to some period of time, but I can assure you that there are. I am not aware of any young offender who is serving. 25 years in well, a facility. No, in fact, that is not the case. Absolutely not. And in fact, what this legislation does is ensure that young offenders are not placed in adult prison populations. In fact, that happens is this, it, indeed it does. In fact, it happens in this country today. It happens too much in this country. Madame and McLennan, part of are you saying, Madame McLennan, that the province could uh, apply the old law as it was? This law will change nothing there is, if they want to? There is nothing in this law that requires a province, for example, like Quebec, to change the, the approach it takes to so use they justice. they can ignore this new law? No, they can't ignore the law. The law will apply. And people will, in fact, be charged they will be under, under this law. But, in fact, Quebec, those things that Quebec does in terms of diversion of young people, their real, uh, rehabilitative regime, there is absolutely no reason or anything in this legislation for uh, uh, that would lead Quebec to change that. So why do we need a law then? Ago. Pardon me? So why should Quebec be more open about this today than four months ago? Well, I hope that Quebec isn't angry. I hope that Quebec sees this as a... Uh, ...side in the House of Commons. Uh, uh, Mike, did, we did you predict say anything? A, did we predict accurately what the flow would be? It was basically all about the province of Quebec and why are you doing this to Quebec? The reason uh, we heard all of this today, because we normally uh, don't hear it on TV, is that Ms. McClellan doesn't speak French fluently enough to be interviewed in French by French reporters, Quebec reporters, and so a lot of those questions asked in English were being asked by Quebec reporters uh, who are seeking her answers on why are you once again doing this terrible thing to Quebec, and if it doesn't change the current law, why do we need it? So uh, she was giving uh, those answers, and as you can see, uh, on the Quebec news agenda at the very least, this is a very big deal. So uh, when the question was asked, uh, uh, she, she said, basically, the bill does nothing to prevent Quebec from, con from continuing with their current approach uh, in doing what they have done. So when a reporter posed the question, then, then we can just ignore the bill, she said, no, you can't ignore the bill. Uh, but that leaves a big question in people's minds. Absolutely. Well, what they're basically saying is that Quebec has to be cognizant of it, but there are still me mechanisms for them to work around it. Vic Taves was the Attorney General of Manitoba, ran as a Canadian Alliance candidate and won in the last election. He's at the microphone now on behalf of the Canadian Alliance. Programs ...which we believe are essential as well, they're not prepared to fund them. So are you saying that if there was additional funds, you'd be prepared to support the No, bill? I'm not saying that. What but are your objections to the well, uh, provisions? I'm, I'm, I'm going to read the entire bill. But, uh, well, but you're familiar with the last one. I, I'm certainly, out. I'm certainly right. familiar so, with the. So it's yeah. not and substantially one. changed. What are your objections to? Well, primary we, thrust we the certainly bill? want to ensure that violent, repeat offenders are held accountable in the adult court, and we, we're not satisfied that the provisions are clear enough to ensure that that accountability with violent, repeat offenders is uh, is maintained. Providing adult sentences isn't enough? Provi well, uh, I mean, does that in fact mean that they will go to adult court, that they will be responsible in an adult format? I don't know. Having uh, having simply uh, skimmed the bill 15 minutes ago, I, I don't, I can't say. What about the, um, the emphasis on rehabilitation in the bill? Do you have objections to that? We don't have any uh, problem with rehabilitation. Uh, the question is, where are we spending our money on and who are we spending it on? If what are you saying it's being spent on? Well, first of all, they're not putting enough money in place. That's clear. 
uh, they said $206 million over three years. The implementation costs of this bill alone are $100 million. Uh, the province of Quebec has said uh, it would cost them $25 million to implement. Those are just implementation costs. The province of Ontario is obviously more. Smaller provinces, $5 million. That's just the implementation cost. That, that isn't the increased cost. And so now they've said $206 million over three years. That's nothing. I won't touch even uh, getting the bill rolling. So do you think that's the text that you'll be taking on in committee on this bill, that it's the funding well, to support the bill that's the problem, not the bill itself? Oh, no, 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 no. There, there are uh, provisional problems, and we'll deal with them in a substantive way as we, as we proceed uh, on, an, on an individual basis. But I think that, um, that uh, if uh, just taking them at their face value in terms of what they're saying this bill does, they won't be able to accomplish it because they're not prepared to give the money. Simple as that. Is, it, is there not an obligation, Victor, to let this, this, this bill go forward because it was an election and the Canadian public haven't really spoken on it? No, I don't, I don't think the Canadian public has spoken at all on, on this uh, particular bill. I think that there were certain commitments that the uh, government members made during the election, but I don't see those being carried out in terms of a genuine attempt to ensure that violent offenders are held accountable, and secondly, that there's adequate funding in place to ensure that these programs can be implemented. Isn't this the same old tax and spend rhetoric that the Reform Party is getting to be known for? Tax and spend... Uh, well, you keep saying they should spend more money. Well, no, no. All I'm saying is that if they are serious about implementing this program, why aren't they prepared to put money in, in terms of implementing it? Seriously, what do you think, what do you think the, of the provincial aspect of it, where the provinces decide? Well, look, at the provinces, this, this is a federal program. What the, uh, what the federal government, though, has said is saying, here, the responsibility is yours, you deal with it. But doesn't that mean the you, heat goes with that then, or like you're calling hands the heat go, to the provinces? It hands all the heat to them and hands all the costs to them. So as the costs escalate, who picks them up? The provinces. And the provinces are rightfully concerned, saying, here you are, you're giving us the political football, plus you're asking us to pay for it. Does your party still believe that 10-year-olds should be dealt with in the criminal law justice system? What we have said is that... Can you speak there, to the mic, please? Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, what we have said is that, that youthful offenders need to be held accountable. And uh, whether... Uh, whether that involves punitive measures or rehabilitative measures. Under the present act, there is no way of holding 10- and 11-year-olds accountable. In certain cities, for example, like Winnipeg, where the gangs are utilizing 10- and 11-year-old children who are becoming very sophisticated, the courts have no criminal jurisdiction under the Youth Justice Act or under the Young Offenders Act to ensure that they can deal with those children at a young age to ensure that they don't continue. Alliance Justice critic uh, Vic Taves responding to Canada's Youth Criminal Justice Act uh, tabled by Justice Minister Anne McClellan in the House today. There's a big concern, Mike, over uh, loopholes in this act. Absolutely. Uh, what Vic Taves is saying is she says the right thing. A meeting of personalities. Yes, it's very important for Jean Chrétien to establish a warm rapport with George W. Bush. Of course, he had a very good relationship with President Clinton. They used to golf together. They spent a lot of time one-on-one -on -one together. Chrétien wants to try and create the same kind of relationship with Bush. Um, and it's more important, in fact, this time because there were some reports in the media it, during the election campaign that perhaps the Liberals would have preferred a Democratic president. Of course, Kretcher didn't get that, and he has hotly denied those claims. However, he wants to try and smooth, uh, smooth the waters and make sure that he does have a good relationship with Bush. So how does he go about doing that? Well, they're going to spend a half an hour together, just one-on-one. -on -one. Then they're going to be having a working dinner tonight. No doubt there will be some serious issues that will come up. But also, you know, Kretchen is a very... Uh, you know, he's a very charismatic guy, as is Bush. They're both people that get along well with people, and they realize that, you know, this is the biggest trading relationship that both countries have, and that it's very important that, uh, you know, as first leaders, that they get along. Is he confident at this point that George W. Bush realizes uh, the massive effects of their trading relationship? Oh, absolutely. I mean, to, when you consider the importance of the economy between the two countries, uh, it's important that Kretchen establish a, a rapport a personal bond with the new president. And that's not going to be easy because I think the Republicans know pretty well that Canada wasn't rooting for them at all and made that public. So Kretchen has to get over that. And second, he has to make the Canadian claim uh, to Bush if he doesn't know 
Uh, he's got to remind him about the importance of the trade relationship between the two countries, remind him that 25% uh, of all American exports come to Canada, uh, that it's worth about a billion dollars a day, and that millions of his fellow Americans are tied to the relationship between Canada and the U.S. in terms of trade. If he can succeed in doing those two things, uh, the meeting will have been worthwhile. There's a lot more, but that's what's most important. Considering that uh, the first uh, foreign visit that uh, George W. Bush is going to take is going to be to Mexico, is that a bad sign at all for Canada uh, or not? Well, you know, I think it is something the Canadians are a little worried about. Uh, we have always felt that the most special relationship, quote unquote, that uh, the United States has is with us. But Bush has a close relationship with Mexico. First, on a personal basis, remember he and Vicente Fox, the new president of Mexico, the first Democratic president, we're both governors together, and they both have ranches. When Fox was here in Ottawa, he had on cowboy boots and a rodeo belt. Uh, they have a close personal relationship, um, and Mexico's economy is growing quickly. And so that uh, I think the Canadians want to remind the Americans that when the word border comes up, uh, Mr. Bush should be thinking about the northern border, not the southern one all the time. But, he, but there are those who say he always thinks about the southern border. In the end, is that going to have an effect on uh, any of these trade issues? Is he going to feel all that disposed towards uh, solving some problems in Canada's favor? Uh, well, you know, interests are more important than individuals. I mean, he has got to be educated about the importance of the economic relationship between these two countries. But a personal rapport is critical. I mean, in the case, for instance, of Brian Mulroney and uh, Bush's father, had they not had the close personal relationship they had, the ability to get on the phone, trust each other, and make deals, we probably wouldn't have, have had a free trade agreement. We certainly wouldn't have, in fact. Now, that may, some people may wish we didn't. But if you think the free trade agreement was a good thing, and I think most people now do, uh, a lot of it was due to the personal rapport, that bond between the two leaders. And I have to ask you, of course, Brian Mulroney has uh, surfaced again, and he is actually advising George W. Bush. What do you make of that? Uh, well, I would worry about that a little if I was Mr. Kretchen because you cannot underestimate the bitterness uh, on the part of Mr. Mulroney about Mr. Kretchen based on the Airbus case. Um, and so uh, the fact that Mulroney is advising... Uh, this really uh, is a get-to-know-you meeting, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Uh, if there's one thing that's important out of this, it's uh, Jean Kretchen's ability, and he has a lot of it, to build a an easy, uh, smooth, personal relationship, a bond, a rapport, whatever you want to call it. And if you need some evidence of how important that is, uh, when all the difficult issues come and go, uh, just consider the free trade agreement. Uh, under uh, Brian Mulroney and uh, Bush uh, Sr., uh, it was completely coming apart. Uh, the, the whole deal was collapsing. Uh, sorry, under, under Reagan, rather. Um, and, uh, and Mulroney finally said, look, uh, he made a personal phone call and said, we have to deal with this personally at the level of leaders. Uh, and so they brought in James Baker, their most brilliant, best troubleshooter, and that's when the deal became, uh, started to come together. And it was all because Mulroney was able to pick up the phone and, and fall back on a personal relationship between he and an American president. That is critical, and, and there are new challenges for Kretchen in that regard, and, and, and I won't take up too much of your time at this moment, but we should talk about how U.S.-Canada relations have changed very dramatically at the beginning of this century. Well, they certainly have, and, and we're hearing that Brian Mulroney, who had a very good relationship with George Bush Sr., is now coming back into the mix. What will that mean for Kretchen's relationship with Bush Jr.? Well, uh, I can't believe that Mulroney would do anything to jeopardize U.S.-Canada relations. I mean, he lives here, uh, he profits from his life here. Uh, but if I were Kretchen, I would certainly be nervous about that. I'd be nervous about my ability to connect, to really connect with this guy. Absolutely, and, and it would probably send some mixed signals as well. Well, that's what I mean. I, I, you can be sure that Mulroney may not be saying pleasant things about Kretchen personally to W. And, you know, you cannot underestimate the depth of the bitterness and the anger, which has probably receded to some degree, uh, on Brian Mulroney's part about Airbus. Uh, Mulroney's people feel, felt then, still feel that this was a personal uh, attack on Mulroney, uh, which did tremendous damage to him in Mulroney's view internationally uh, on the part of Kretchen. Right. Whether that's true or not, that's what Mulroney thought. Craig, we're going to bring in Alan Fryer, who is in Washington. Um, 
And Alan, you know, we were talking earlier that uh, the softwood lumber issue is probably one of the, the big ones that they might touch on tonight because of the time issue involved. Right, that's, uh, you know, that, that's an irritant that's existed between uh, the two countries for years and years. Uh, it's flared up from time to time, and the uh, five-year uh, deal, which essentially uh, established quotas, uh, is up next month. And as you say, that's going to be the first big trade issue uh, that the two countries are going to have to deal with. <clears throat> Let's not expect uh, that that's going to be dealt with in any uh, great detail tonight. They're certainly not going to uh, solve this issue. But I, I think what a lot of officials are looking for is perhaps uh, some sign, some uh, direction uh, from the two leaders that, uh, uh, you know, the, the, there's been a lot of talk uh, perhaps about uh, uh, appointing special envoys, one special envoy from each country, uh, to perhaps come up with some interim agreement before, uh, you know, a permanent solution can be uh, found. But I think uh, both uh, uh, Mr. Bush and Mr. Kretschmer are well aware that uh, they need to do something uh, lest this issue spin out of control again, as it has done in the past. Right. There are a lot of people saying that, uh, in a way, Kretschmer was getting the consolation prize in that Bush is going to visit Vicente Fox in his first uh, foreign visit, um, and this could perhaps indicate that Bush is leading more toward um, a relationship with Latin America rather than Canada, or at least there will be some sort of competition that will now be between the two countries for Bush's attention. Well, you know, I, I, I think a lot has been made of that, and uh, I think one of the things that the two men want to do is uh, smooth down some feathers. Uh, as you say, there were some noses out of joint uh, when Mr. Bush announced first that uh, uh, his first foreign foray was going to be to Mexico. Of course, uh, Mr. Bush, as governor of Texas, has had uh, much more to do with Mexico than uh, any sort of Canada-U.S. relations. So there's that, and also uh, noses out of joint uh, uh, here in, in Washington, uh, a lot of high-level officials in Washington feel that the, uh, uh, the liberal government in Ottawa, through remarks made by the former ambassador here, uh, that perhaps that they were uh, uh, favoring Al Gore during the election over Mr. Bush. So uh, these are a couple of things that I think uh, both men are going to uh, try to smooth over. Uh, Craig made the point that the uh, personal relationship at the, at the top is so important in managing this billion-dollar-a-day uh, business relationship that exists between the two countries. And I think uh, the men have to get to know each other and get to the point where uh, when these trouble spots do arise, they can uh, pick up the phone and, and start fixing them before they get out of hand. Right. Craig, how is the Mexico angle playing in Ottawa? Uh, I think what is very interesting, as this century begins and U.S.-Canadian relations begin a new era, uh, the fact of Mexico uh, looms very large. Uh, first, because, remember, Mexico is now a democracy. Second, I think that we have to set aside a lot of our stereotypes about Mexico being a number of, uh, b being a land of uh, peasant peons uh, and dirt farmers. Uh, if you bought in Canada uh, over Christmas a lot of uh, uh, computers and other highly technical stuff, uh, it could easily have been made in Mexico. You could have been buying cars that were made in Mexico. The Mexican economy is changing dramatically. Uh, Vincente Fox, the new leader of Mexico is a uh, is is really a high profile character. Uh, he, and when he was here in Ottawa, he had on a rodeo belt and cowboy boots. He's got a ranch. George Bush has a ranch. They visit each other's ranches. They knew each other when, as Alan says, um, uh, Bush was a governor. Vincente Fox was a governor. Uh, when when you talk about borders to Bush, he thinks Mexico. So one of Kretchen's big jobs today is going to be to remind the president of what Alan was saying, the billion dollar relationship, 25% of all American exports coming to this country. He's got to remind him of all that, but I tell you what, I don't think the special relationship with Canada, which we've always cherished, is going to be quite as special as it has been in the past now that Mexico has and is changing so fast. Back to you, Alan. Uh, it is being said that you know, you're trying to find likenesses between Bush and Kretchen, that they have sort of a similar management style. What do you think about that? Well, that, that's certainly something that uh, American officials have been pointing out, and uh, one thing that they hope will help the two men hit it off. Uh, you know, Mr. Bush uh, puts an awful lot of stock in his own, uh, his character, his personal charm, uh, his ability to uh, reach out to political opponents uh, and make things work. And Jean Chrétien as well, I think, uh, you know, shows that uh, uh, similar style in that he puts a lot of 
uh, a lot of stock in uh, personal relationships uh, uh, that he establishes with foreign leaders. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think uh, I do see similarities. There are also a lot of differences uh, which are of concern to officials as well, uh, political differences, and I think uh, uh, we're going to see them uh, perhaps start to address some of those over dinner tonight. Right. I'm going to bring my studio guests into the mix right now. I know they're just dying to jump in. Uh, Professor Ed Dawson of York University and Professor Daniel Marion, thanks so much for coming in. Uh, what do you think will be accomplished this evening other than just a get-to-know-you session? Well, I think the meeting is going to be quite successful. All of the signals are good. Um, for example, Bush has left the American ambassador in Ottawa. We have an excellent ambassador, Mike Kurgan, in Washington. It's been tightly scripted. It's tremendously important for us. And George Bush has inherited a very sound bilateral relationship, which is important. So I think there's a lot of incentive on both sides to have a, a, a good get-together and established relationship. But, but apart from the short term, I do think that there are some medium-term issues that we should keep our eye on. Such w as? One is that this is not just a relationship that concerns the president. It also concerns the Congress. And in something like the softwood lumber dispute, we need a good relationship with the president to help deal with the Congress. But the president by himself cannot settle something like that. The second is we have a wide variety of defense and environmental issues on hand, like the missile shield that's being proposed or Arctic drilling. These are significant in Canadian public opinion. But most important, I'd like to jump in on the issue of Mexico. The issue isn't who visits who first uh, in the year 2001. It's that Mexico it has 100 million people and is becoming so much more important. But there also are millions of Mexicans and Latin Americans who are now American citizens. It's a huge voting block there that becomes very significant. Um, there has been a shift of political power towards the South and California that's been ongoing for 20 years, 30 years. But now it's complete. And I do think it signals very much the end of a special relationship. I think we, uh, I agree with my colleague, I think we also, we have to be uh, careful about not putting too much emphasis on personality issues. Uh, for one thing, uh, Mr. Bush is going to have to get used to the fact that probably all the governments in the world, except perhaps the uh, Mexican president, all the governments in the world would have liked uh, Mr. Gore to have been elected. That's certainly the, ca the case for Western Europe. And if uh, it would be impossible for Mr. Gore, excuse me, for Mr. Bush to keep on reproaching um, uh, this to uh, the people he will be meeting starting tonight. Mm -hmm. um, but the, 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 the second point is more important. The heavy structural uh, trends are um, in a direction that does not uh, very much favor Canada. They do favor a focus on uh, uh, Mexico and Latin America. There will be uh, the meeting in uh, Quebec City in April to try to launch or rekindle uh, the, uh, the I'm gonna have of to the stop you. I'm going to have to stop you right there. We're going to go to a break right now. We'll continue with this conversation right after this. Stay with us. The future of news is interactive, online, convenient, and Canada's number one source. Get the news you want anytime, anywhere. The future of news is here. CTVnews.com. Face it, Paul, you can't get rich because your investment income is too high. So we figured out a way to defer your current income to increase your net worth. So I can make more by making less. Interesting. Every day we help more Canadians make the most of their money. Investors Group. Solutions built around you. Make the most of your online time with DigitalDesk.com. Are you ready to see yourself as others see you? I didn't know I was so gray. Gray, gray, gray. Now escape that old gray look with new Just For Men. More than a hair color, it's the rejuvenator. Just For Men shampoos away gray in five easy minutes and now has vitamins. It brings back a thicker, healthier look that's completely natural. I like what I see. Just For Men. More than a hair color. It's the rejuvenator. 
Welcome back. Here are some of our top stories. A gunman opened fire at an engine plant near Chicago today, killing five people. Hospital officials say four others were injured, two of them critically. The mayor of Melrose Park, Illinois, says the gunman was armed with an AK-47 and a 38 caliber revolver. Police sources say the gunman had been fired from the Navistar plant two years ago for stealing engine parts. Holiday shoppers pushed up department store sales in December to $1.5 billion. That's a 3.3% gain over November, which in turn had declined about the same amount from October. The picture isn't so good for the entire year. Sales were up only 2% to about $18 billion. That is the smallest annual increase since a 1.7% decline in 1993. Police arrested Phoenix Suns forward Clifford Robinson overnight on charges of driving under the influence and marijuana possession. Officers in Scottsdale, Arizona stopped the Suns forward at about 1.30 this morning. He was released about three hours later. Sigourney so Weaver has jumped on board for another alien sequel. The actress apparently signed on after being offered a $22 million U.S. paycheck. That would make her the highest paid actress ever for a single movie. Weaver will star and also serve as executive producer. Alien 5 may be released in 2004, the 25th anniversary of the original. And a quick look at, uh, quick look at weather rather across the country this evening. For Vancouver, cloudy periods and a low of minus 1. Calgary, partly cloudy, a low of minus 14. Toronto, cloudy and a low near 6. And that's minus six, actually. In Halifax, snow, heavy at times, possibly mixed with periods of ice pellets. The low near minus four this evening. Then temperatures rising to zero overnight. Now we're going to go back to our live coverage of the Jean Chrétien and uh, George Bush meeting this evening in Washington. I'm going to go back to Craig Oliver in Ottawa, first of all, Craig. Mm -hmm. And we have been saying that this is a get-to-know-you meeting, but we were also mentioning the fact that Mulroney, Brian Mulroney, had a wonderful relationship with yeah. George Bush Sr. Now he seems to be uh, coming back into the mix. At, at What is the timing and, and, that it's all about? And don't forget, by the way, also a very close relationship, a singing relationship. They were a duet uh, with the Ronald Reagan uh, uh -huh. as, at the Shamrock Summit, where the free trade agreement really was born. Uh, so I don't think there's any chance that Cretchen is going to be able to have as successful a personal rapport with uh, W uh, as he had with Bill Clinton. And I wonder to what degree uh, Mr. Mulroney may have poisoned the well to this extent. Remember that these politicians, people forget that even though their nations have interests and those do have a weight uh, of their own, uh, they, they are human. They have big egos. They are sensitive. And uh, Mulroney has already said that he did mention to Bush that Canadian officials didn't expect him to win and may not have preferred him. And here's a guy who's going into a meeting after a campaign which was traumatic for him, a very tough campaign. He didn't even win the popular majority of American votes. And he's facing a guy who he knows didn't really want him to be there. Who else didn't want him to be there? Mr. Gore didn't want him to be there. Uh, this will be, I think, quite difficult for Cretchen. Well, back to my guests in the studio, uh, professors from York University. And I want to ask you, uh, what do you think, if anything, the common ground is here? What will they, they see as that they're on the same wavelength on? What issues? The need to make the largest trade relationship work. I think that's going to be the, the, the driving thing. I think it's, no, uh, it's obvious that the, perhaps uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Chrétien would have uh, done better with Mr. Uh, Gore. That's obvious. But the need to make that trade relationship work, the need for uh, the United States also perhaps to bring Canada into the national missile defense system. Perhaps my colleague, my colleague could t talk more about this but I see a need for this. Um, there's going to be a lot of uh, uh, contentious issues also. The softwood lumber has been mentioned, but we should think about uh, Mr. Bush wants to uh, start, for reasons I have yet to understand, wants to start soon to drill oil in Alaska. How is this oil going to be uh, uh, brought down to the United States via a pipeline that goes through Canada or along the shores of Canada by uh, tankers? That's an issue with environmental consideration that will also be uh, very much um, a contentious issue that will have to be solved. But um, the, the very fact that these two large economies are very integrated and are growing in integration, are integrating more and more, that's going to be the driving force that uh, hopefully will, uh, should actually uh, overcome these personality issues. Right. Alan Fryer in Washington? Well, it, 
Yes, I'm still here. Okay. Uh, if, if I can uh, just jump into, obviously there's a lot of interest uh, among Canadians and, and the Canadian media in this, uh, uh, in this visit, Jennifer, but it's also very interesting because usually when a Canadian Prime Minister comes to Washington, we're the only ones that really uh, pay much attention to it. Uh, it goes largely ignored by the American media, but I, I, I think I'm safe in saying not this time. Uh, there, there is a lot of interest uh, on, on uh, the part of the American networks to this uh, visit, uh, simply because uh, Mr. Bush is uh, a rookie stepping onto the ice and is, uh, for the first time in this first uh, big game, uh, up against uh, uh, the veteran uh, Mr. Chan. So a lot of uh, our colleagues in the American media very, very interested in seeing uh, how Mr. Bush uh, conducts himself uh, during these meetings and what kind of reaction uh, there is uh, to him uh, on the Canadian side. Right, Craig. Well, as far as the advising, the being advised uh, on either side goes, uh, I know there are a lot of people out there uh, on both in both camps who are, you know, sort of sort of putting their two cents in. Uh, what do you think uh, as far as? Who's advising who and what kind of advice they are getting on the issues? Well, uh, you know, the advice they're getting is predictable. It's what our, uh, these, the other gentlemen were saying a few moments ago about having to make this immense and complex relationship work. But speaking about the kind of leverage that Kretchen has going into that meeting, first, on the missile defense, uh, I think that most people would agree they can't do it without us. Uh, that is one fact. The other fact is, uh, as Alan was saying, uh, Bush needs to look good in the minds of the American people in terms of his ability to handle foreign relations. That's about all presidents have left anymore. Uh, and he will be very anxious to look good at the Quebec summit. This will be his first meeting on the world stage with a lot of other important world leaders. And Chrétien will play an important part in that as the host. He can help George Bush W look good and that will be important to Bush so so it isn't as if and then add to that to the fact that millions of Americans are tied to Canada through through jobs uh, and through the through the economic connection between the two countries Kretchen does have some leverage as he goes into that meeting right well getting back to uh, you know the being advised and Kretchen making some guffaws you know in, in recent trips uh, what what kind of uh, script do you think he's on this evening? Don't talk, about, don't talk about Florida. <laughs> no, we don't get into that. But what do you think, Craig? Uh, well, I, I think we've already covered that. That's clear. He has got to establish a, uh, the best rapport he possibly can. I don't know how he does that with a guy who's a former baseball owner. Uh, maybe they go out in the Rose Garden and they, maybe they toss baseballs. I don't know. Come on, let's play catch for a while. <laughs> um, uh, and the other thing he's got to do is uh, establish Canada's bona fides as the other gentlemen were saying, uh, as America's largest trading partner, don't forget that, Mr. Bush. Uh, you need us, too. Right. Professor Marion. Dossman. Dossman? I'm sorry, Dossman. <laughs> we'll, we'll throw to you first, and then we'll go back to you, Marion. Okay. Uh, Professor Marion. I think it's a big issue, the Quebec summit. This is a chance for President Bush to shine, and Canada and the United States undoubtedly share an interest in the success of trade policy in the Americas. This is a hugely complex relationship. Both sides want it to work. And uh, our ambassador, Mike Kurgut, was there also in the early 1990s. So he knows a lot of the people. I think it's going to go well. But these longer term issues are, I think, quite important. And what's different between Gore and Bush is that most Canadians do not feel enormously comfortable with the politics of many of the Bush supporters. It's hugely conservative, um, whereas Gore was, so to speak, you know, kind of mainstream. Mm -hmm. So the countries are not exactly in sync politically. So I think that's going to have to work itself through. But in the end, the great, the great thing is that the relationship is in good shape now, and both have an incentive to make it work. Right. Where do you think that uh, both sides will be when the Summit of the Americas comes about in April? You know, I, I'd like not to answer the question. I'd like to answer another question, and I'll come back to yours first. Absolutely. You go ahead and direct it. One, <laughs> uh, one of the things that uh, 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 interrogates me, one of the things that concerns me, is that in 1980, the United States got Ronald Reagan. In uh, 84, we got Brian Mulroney. In 92, they got Clinton, and then uh, I think in 93, we got Chrétien. 
Um, it, it is quite possible that the election of Mr. Bush uh, in uh, Washington is a signal of a rekindling of the Reagan revolution in the United States and in other Western countries. Don't forget that uh, with Clinton, there's also Blair in England, there's also Jospin in France and so on. There has been a sort of a pause in this uh, deepening of free market uh, political economies. Um, I am concerned that the, this, uh, the election of Bush could signal the rekindling of this, and eventually in Canada too. Certainly this is very broad and, and mushy and diffuse, but I think uh, I see this emerging. Certainly more specific today, um, uh, Mr. Bush was uh, um, launching or publicizing his very large uh, tax cut that he wants to push through Congress. Now, I haven't done the math exactly, and allow me a little fuzzy math, but I have a hard time feeling, uh, thinking that the Canada could sustain its broad programs of social services, including health services, uh, over the long run if we are in economic competition for the localization of firms with a, a, a state that has so little uh, taxation as the United States. You're going to have to hold that thought. We're going to come back to you in just a moment. First, I have to update people on some of the other stories that are making headlines at this hour. The federal government has begun the process of changing Canada's youth justice laws. The act introduced today is substantially the same bill first introduced in March of 1999. It proposes tougher treatment for serious violent offenses and more efforts to rehabilitate non-violent youth. A downturn in trading by individual investors has dented Canada's discount brokerage firms. Canadian discounters say they are flexible enough to deal with the slowdown without cutting staff or forcing reduced hours the way some U.S. firms have. However, plans for hiring new employees or expanding have been put on hold. In the U.S. last week, Charles Schwab said it would trim costs by asking employees to take extra days off. Charles Schwab, Canada's executive chief, says that move will not be duplicated here. Indiana's Halen Rose is missing $2,000 that was taken from his belongings while his Pacers played at Milwaukee Saturday, but it could have been worse. Police found nearly $250,000 worth of jewelry taken from Rose under a seat at the Bradley Center. The man the FBI says sent them a letter threatening Moon Zappa will not face federal charges, but he could go to trial in California State Court. A federal judge says because Timothy Mark Brownfield did not send the letter directly to Zappa, it is not a federal case. Brownfield claims Zappa and her dad stole the lyrics of Valley Girl from him. Zappa's asked the court for a restraining order against Brownfield. And a quick look at weather across the country this evening for Vancouver. Cloudy periods and a low of minus 1. Calgary partly cloudy, a low of minus 14. Toronto cloudy and a low near minus 6. And Halifax Snow, heavy at times, possibly mixed with periods of ice pellets below near minus four this evening. Then the temperatures will rise to zero overnight. We will be back with more live coverage of the Cretchen Bush meeting this evening. Please stay with us. A billion dollars. That's how much Oracle saved in one year using its own e-business software. How much will you save? Oracle. Software powers the Internet. There is a car moving in a new direction. Which direction are you moving in? The new Volvo S60. Time's up. <coughs> Would someone please tell Mr. Taylor what he should have taken before coming here today? Fennel and First Defense, sir. Why? Because it sounds like he's getting a cold. And? First Defense is the only Benelin formula specifically designed to... To relieve early, early cold symptoms. Such as? Scratchy throat, stuffed nose, and... <coughs> I suggest you reread the chapters on airborne diseases. Benelin First Defense. Don't let cold symptoms take hold. I... <laughs> Life is filled with tough decisions. With Kellogg's Mini Wheats, you don't have to decide. It's nutritious and delicious. I don't know. Mom, Dad, school's closed today, so we can go tobogganing and skating and rent some movies and have a pillow fight, build a snow fort and buy a pony, and make some cookies and buy some new toys, and you can play with us and build a snowman and buy some skis and play hockey and have a snowball fight and paint by numbers and go to peace. Styles and fashion change every day, and so do you. That's why Always has designed one box 
with a combination of three different packs for the right protection, no matter what you need. The always multi-pack, a choice that's right for everyone. This portion of Newsnet is brought to you by Standard Life. Profit from our knowledge. All kinds of dreams bubble up from fertile imaginations. Investing with Standard Life can help you realize your childhood dreams. And more. Standard Life. Profit from our knowledge. Standard Life can help you now to realize your childhood dreams. And more. And turn your investments into a roaring success. Standard Life. Profit from our knowledge. This is CTV Newsnet. Welcome back. We are waiting to hear from President Bush and Jean Chrétien. They will be doing a question and answer session with the press before they go into dinner this evening in Washington. And Alan Fryer is there uh, waiting for all of this to happen. We did get a shot of the uh, White House just momentarily, Alan. I guess things were about to happen. What kind of questions and answers can we expect this evening? Well, it looks as if uh, reporters, as you say, are lining up uh, for their crack at the two leaders. They'll be peppered uh, with questions from both uh, uh, Canadian and American journalists. Uh, I expect uh, uh, the, the uh, questions to focus on trade, uh, to focus on some of the disputes that we've talked about or potential disputes that we've talked about between Canada and the U.S., uh, the missile defense shield, uh, drilling in the Arctic uh, among them. Uh, there may be a question on softwood lumber. And I suspect there's going to be some question to uh, Mr. Bush as to uh, how he feels uh, about the perception that Canada, or at least the Liberal government, uh, was uh, favoring Al Gore over him uh, in the election. So uh, don't be surprised to uh, see a few questions on that topic. Right, Craig? Uh, well, uh, as Alan knows well, one of the things American reporters do is Whenever a foreign visitor shows up at the White House, whether he's from Zambia or anywhere, it doesn't matter, they go so they can ask the president questions about uh, U.S. issues. So there will be some questions which Canadians will be saying, what? Huh? Mm -hmm. What was that question all about? Uh, we can expect that from the American reporters, too. Right. And I think you're going to see a lot of questions about uh, the main issue that Mr. Bush was handling today, which, of course, was his 1.6 trillion dollar U.S. Uh, plan to tax uh, to cut taxes. So uh, expect a lot of questions from the American media on that subject. Well, touching on the Canadian economy, uh, how much of a factor do you think that will have in the relationship between the two countries at this point? Uh, a factor in what respect? Uh, uh, well, you mean in terms the, of the a downturn? The fact that our dollar is, is struggling so much. The... Uh, our dollar for the past 10 years has been collapsing against the American dollar. That is certainly a problem for us, and it's a big problem in terms of interest rates. Uh, if we're going to be competing with the Americans, if we're into some kind of a tit-for-tat battle on interest rates, uh, we are into a big problem, because as we drop our interest rates, the dollar drops further. I mean, how low can we allow the Canadian dollar to go before we start saying, maybe we should readjust things here, maybe we better go to an American dollar. I mean, that is not beyond the realm of possibility. Right, I know that uh, Professor Dosman and uh, Professor Marion of York University want to jump in on this mm -hmm. particular issue. Well, I'd like to say I agree with, the, with this reflection on the dollar. Uh, at what point uh, do American firms buy up the whole country, lock, stock, and barrel? Like, at what point does one marginalize oneself with these interest rates? And if there's one issue that has to be addressed on the medium term for Canada, it's to get back the loss that we've experienced in the last 20 years, which has been dramatic in terms of interest rates, in terms of the dollar, but also in terms of the standard of living. But I wanted to make a comment about the press conference coming up. Yes, please. I think an interesting test will be how Chrétien handles the missile defense shield issue. Mm -hmm. Because on this one, he's been... Uh, he's, he's, his p position is clear uh, during the visit of the, of the uh, Russian uh, delegation recently, Putin. He's opposed. He's opposed it as illegal, as dangerous, as costly, as ineffective, and so forth. He's on record. Uh, but there's a, quite a consensus in the Bush administration to proceed with it. Now the question will be, should it be bargained? Should it be managed, or should we say no? It would be very interesting to see what happens. Yeah, if I can intervene on oh, that. Oh, certainly. Uh, Go right ahead. Uh, there, there are some signs uh, that the uh, government here is beginning to back away from the Lloyd Axworthy position, which is 
tell them no, tell them no now. Uh, John Manley is taking a much softer approach, saying, well, we'd like to talk to the Russians and the Chinese and see what their views of this are. And, uh, and I think that Mr. Kretchen got way too far out on a limb on that. And I don't think this country can afford to say no, because if we do, we may lose the NORAD agreement, and we could never afford to surveil uh, that huge Arctic of ours on our own. Professor Marion? I think the only obstacle left to uh, the, the shield is a, a protest, a large-scale protest movement in the United States that was resembled what happened under Reagan when uh, people were protesting the deployment of missiles in Europe. Uh, and I don't see this uh, forming, and I'm very uh, surprised, actually. This is a very debatable idea, the, the idea of a nuclear missile shield. There's a lot of unmet social needs in the United States. Uh, large amounts of money will be committed to this military expenditure. Uh, probably it won't work, uh, at least not as well as it's supposed to do. Uh, and uh, what strikes me the most is that within American domestic politics, there are good reasons to have a debate about this. The, issue, the idea should not be that advanced or that broadly accepted, and yet it is, and there's nobody that seems to be responding or reacting or opposing it. Uh, I'm very, very surprised about this, and I agree with my colleague. It will be a test for uh, m Mr. Chrétien. Alan Pryor in Washington, back to you. Does there seem to be some sort of a delay at this point with them coming out of their first initial meeting before going into dinner? Uh, well, of course, it's always hard to say. Uh, you know, these uh, leaders don't make their timetable according to our needs. Uh, if the conversation is going well, um, uh, if, if they feel that this part of the meeting should continue, obviously uh, the journalists are going to be kept at bay uh, waiting for when they're ready to see it. If I can just uh, hop in, too, on missile defense, mm -hmm. I, I, I think the professor is right. And, and perhaps one reason uh, that the Canadian government is leaning back a little bit on this just to see what happens is that this is far from being a done deal. Mr. Bush uh, has come into office with, without anything uh, uh, resembling a strong mandate. Uh, to pursue this. Yes, there is a lot of support within his administration to go forward, but it's not a done deal. I think Mr. Bush has a lot of selling to do at home on missile defense. Uh, he hasn't been able to show uh, to anybody that this is vi viable technologically or that it could be done for a reasonable cost. Uh, can I just jump in on the politics of meetings? Um, you know that whenever world leaders meet, uh, they always sort of minimize the length the meeting will be. So in this case, we were told 35 or 40 minutes, mm -hmm. so that if they find that that's uh, mm -hmm. all the time they need, they're out of there and nobody can complain. But this will now allow both sides, particularly the Canadians, who are desperate to paint this as just a great, warm, affectionate meeting, it'll allow them to say they were getting along so well that the president just didn't want to give up, that they just kept talking and talking and establishing this wonderful uh, relationship between the two of them. Right. Could that also be fun that uh, they are getting into some major issues during this time? Uh, well, I suppose they could say that, but that wouldn't be bad either, would it? I no. mean, uh, you know, from a Canadian point of view, that would be pretty good if we can get them talking about right. this stuff. Right. Professor Marion has I something have a, to say on that. I have a question for the journalists. I have noticed, uh, as it's <laughs> clear in this conversation, that the professors are focused on structural uh, factors and the journalists on personal factors. I have a question about uh, personal factors to the journalists. What do they make of the, the fact that Mr. Chrétien is not staying over at Blair House, which is the place where diplomats and uh, leaders normally stay over? Is that a sort of a slight, or is there less than that? Well, in the... from, from my point of view, I, I was wondering about that, because I know that Trudeau, even <coughs> when he wasn't getting along very well with the Americans, did right. stay at Blair House. So I wonder if the Americans know how we're going to read this, and I wonder if they're quite happy that we read this as a sign that maybe the administration hasn't really made up their mind yet about Mr. Kretchen. They know, they know how we're going uh, to react to that. Alan, do you have anything uh, to add? Well, it, it could be. Obviously, there, there was some unhappiness, and there, there's no denying that in the Bush administration, uh, to this perception that uh, the Kretchen government was favoring Al Gore uh, over George W. Bush. Uh, those uh, comments were, were uh, read. They were taken heed of. And uh, yes, I think if this, uh, I don't think it's completely unreasonable to uh, read this as uh, some kind of a minor snub, although I wouldn't make too much of it. All right, Professor Dosman of York University has something to add. Well, it's hard, I think, to, to figure the entrails on issues like mm -hmm. this, but it is important to look at the circles around Bush. The uh, main appointments are very experienced, but they're experienced from a decade ago. Uh, and all of them know something about Canada, but really not much. However, much of the policy towards Canada is going to be conducted by lower level 
officials, many of whom are not yet appointed. So it's very difficult to really guess what's going to happen. But I'd like to emphasize and perhaps get some response to that too, that from the journalists, particularly in Washington, um, I think the special relationship is, lar is really over. Uh, I see the pull of Mexico and Latin America um, as substantive, not just personality. That this is something uh, which has been building for a long time. Uh, and, uh, or Craig, go well, ahead. I, I, just, I think that was the point I was making at the very beginning of this, that as we begin a new era this century in U.S.-Canadian relations, the special relationship will never again be as special as it was. Alan, do you have anything to add to that? Well, I think that's, uh, that's probably quite true. And, uh, you know, another reason uh, that Canada is at the forefront of, uh, you know, pushing this uh, free trade agreement uh, of the Americas. Uh, these are, these are uh, potentially very lucrative uh, markets in South and Central America. And uh, certainly Canada, as we move into the 21st century, uh, is going to want a piece of that. Uh, getting back to um, the Mexico relations uh, with, with Bush and the fact that he has, um, I guess, quite a bit in common. He has a friendly relationship with Vicente Fox. Uh, what does Christian have to do in order to, I guess, parlay himself into a similar um, friendship, can we say? Uh, I, for, for myself, I don't think he can do it. I mean, I think that if he can have a, a decent, smooth, working, professional relationship with this man, uh, that's a success. But in terms of the uh, kind of close, warm, personal connection uh, that he had with, uh, with Clinton, uh, I just don't think that's going to happen. And I don't think he can re reproduce the kind of connection that uh, Mulroney had with Reagan and Bush, partly because they are on different planets ideologically. And basically then it's going to be a business, uh, an all business uh, situation uh, between the two? If they're lucky. But remember that in many cases in recent history, uh, Canadian prime ministers and American presidents have been spitting at each other. Uh, Johnson physically <laughs> assaulted Pearson. Uh, in Diefenbaker's case, a bitter, sarcastic... Uh